This morning's scripture will be taken from Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. In the Pew Bible, that will be located on page number 1,207. 1,207. This scripture is a parable, and it is between two men, and one was justified and the other is not justified, as you will notice as the scripture is read. Verse 9, also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful in me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's a beautiful day, and we are so thankful that you are here. If you are a guest today, we are so glad that you have come our way. We hope that you will come back at every opportunity. In speaking with a few people before our worship began this morning, I know that we have some visiting from various states, as well as some from within the state of Florida, and we are just honored that you have come here to worship with us, and we hope that you'll come back at every opportunity to do so and to work together. If you have your bulletin, on the inside of the uh, front page, on the second page there, there's an outline that may serve to help as we go along through the lesson today. We are in a series on things the Bible does not say. And so we'll look at the next, the last in this series uh, in just a moment. Last night, Brian had a graduation dinner. We have three that are graduating this year that have been a part of the youth group, and we're, we're thankful to be able to honor them. But it got me thinking as we were honoring them about graduation. And I heard about a son who was graduating from college, and he went to his father, and he said, Dad, I'd like to borrow $500 to buy a new suit. I'm going to be interviewing, and I want to look good for my job interviews. The dad was kind of taken back and he said, $500? He said, I've bought cars for $500. Why do you need a $500 suit? The son looked at him and he said, that's exactly why. I need a $500 suit so I don't have to drive a $500 car. (laughs) We want our children to be able to improve their lives, to be able to better themselves, and we appreciate every level uh, of success that they have and every opportunity and door that is opened Uh, to them. In this series on things the Bible does not say, we've talked about several different ideas that, again, sometimes because we've heard things so often, we attribute them to the Bible. And certainly this one today, being good is good enough, is something that we frequently hear. It's something that is commonly held by people. 71% of Americans believe in a work based salvation. So this is something that is really frequently seen or heard out among people in our community. But of all the things that we have looked at, this is probably the most dangerous. Because this particular saying is not in the Bible, the idea is not contained in the Bible, and it relates directly to people's salvation. So we need to Think about this one, and we need to evaluate how we are able to discuss 
being good is good enough. People need to recognize what the Bible says. What do most religions teach about good works? When it comes to Judaism or Islam or even Hinduism, there is a certain sense of some reward if the good outweighs the bad. And some people have even heard about Christianity, particularly as those of us who are Christians in wearing the name of Christ go about talking about doing or striving to do and maintain good works. When people hear that, they sometimes mistakenly think that we believe that we hold to the idea that salvation is based on those good works. Nothing could be farther from the truth. They teach a, a works-based relationship to God. That's not what the Bible says. There are a lot of popular shows on TV today, and there's a certain initial, D-I-Y. It's do-it-yourself. And a do-it-yourself religion kind of sounds good. People want to be in charge of their lives. They want to be able to take control of projects and goals. But a do-it-yourself, a, a bootstrap religion is not possible. There's an example in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 11, you may recall that the people got together and they began a project. They started building a tower. The tower was supposed to be built all the way up into the heavens to reach God. What man believed at that time was that man could build a tower and stand at the doorstep of heaven, knock on the gates, and God would open and say, what took you so long? But that's not what God saw. What God saw was that the people there at the Tower of Babel were trying to create a name for themselves. They were trying to accomplish something that God just laughed and said, you're never going to get here that way. And so God confused the people by giving them various languages and they quit the project. Isn't it strange that ever since people have still been trying to build a tower or a staircase to heaven, only they have substituted their good works. That is foolish. That is not how we will draw near to God. If you look at your outline, there's a survey done several years ago of American teenagers. And hundreds of teenagers were interviewed and a couple of or sociologists worked on this project. And a book was written entitled Soul Searching by Christian Smith. And he identified five views or five ideas that were commonly held among American teenagers. Number one, God exists and he made the world. Number two, that God wants people to be good. Number three, that the main goal of life is to be happy. Number four, God's really not too involved unless you have a problem. And then number five, that good people go to heaven. Now this idea, if you look at your blanks there, this is kind of a long title, but it's a moralistic, therapeutic deism. Now I say that not because I didn't come up with this phrase, I'm not that smart. But I'm repeating it because I want you to understand that people think that their moralistic, therapeutic, their relationship to God is that God is based on the philosophy of deism. The idea of deism is that God is far off. God is distant. God's really not too concerned with you or me. God's not too involved in our lives. Now I want you to stop there, time out, and think about this. Have you read any portion of the Bible? If you have read any part of the Bible, you can see God is not distant. God is not removed. God is near. And God very much desires, intends for a relationship with us, with each one of us. God loves us. And so to think that God is just distant or, or removed is a very false concept. And guess who would promote such a view of God? We have an enemy, and Satan wants you to think that God is so far away from you that he can't possibly bother with you. He can't possibly care about you. God, after all, is big. Yes, he's so big that he made the entire universe, but he is near enough that he knows the very 
number of hairs on your head. God cares. This idea of a works-based relationship is based on a false view of God. One of the things that people have a great fear of, the greatest fear that's identified among people is generally loneliness. Think about it. The Bible has been written so that you and I don't ever feel alone. That even if people desert us, even if people deny us, if they hurt us, if they are against us, God is for us. God loves us. And so the Bible answers that. It gives us the greatest goal of life is to have a relationship with God. But I can't get there by myself. In your outline, moral perfection is not attainable. Paul says in Romans 3 and verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. Now Jesus is the only one who's righteous. Paul goes on in Romans 3, 23, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you can't see that, then I would suggest you take a look in the mirror of God's word. Because God clearly defines sin so that every one of us fall into the same category that we realize based on our own choices, our own decisions, that you and I are responsible for doing things that have transgressed or trespassed against the will of God. Yes, you and I have gone out of bounds. And you and I deserve the responsibility of saying that we want to recognize God's goodness. When you think about it, Warren Buffett a few years ago committed more than $30 billion to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. After he did that, he came out publicly and he said, there are many ways to get to heaven, but this is one great way. I want to say something to you that that is not a way to heaven. It doesn't matter, and, I, and don't, don't misunderstand, it's not that he needed to give $50 billion or $100 billion or the whole world. He could not give enough to save himself. We must have God's help. The greatest wisdom that we can achieve is to say, God, you have spoken right. We are not able to save ourselves. Look here with me in Luke chapter 18, the passage that Chuck read for us just a moment ago. I want us to look at a couple of quick stories. First, we've got this parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the publican. Let me bring it down to today, and let me just say that Jesus is using a parable of two people who are contrasted in the minds of his audience. Number one is a good guy, the Pharisee. He does good. He, he stays away from evil that, that he can measure, and he is a good guy, as people refer to goodness. The tax collector is a bad guy. Why? Because as the Jews looked at it, he's in league with the Romans. He's collecting taxes for them. He's working with them. We should be opposed to them. We should do everything to stop and block them. And so good guy versus bad guy. The good guy prays, and notice how he prays there in verse 11. I thank you that I am not like other men. You could stop right there because Jesus is trying to say this parable to those who trusted in themselves. The first thing that we trust in ourselves is when we compare ourselves to others. Just because you compare to others in your mind favorably, back up a bit. Again, if we could attain moral perfection, then you might be able to compare. The fact that people are okay, though, with comparing is because, you know what they've concluded? God grades, grades on the curve. God is going to say, well, if you're better than most people or better than a few, then, all right, you're good enough. Being good is not good enough. Look at what he says. I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. He talks about the things he does. Look at the tax collector in verse 13. Standing afar off, this man is broken. This man is humble. This man is sorrowful for his sin. And notice what he says. Beating his breast, he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Good guy versus bad guy. Which one does Jesus say is justified? Not the good guy. Everyone is standing around, as Jesus says this, with their jaw gaped. 
they're looking and they're going, what? That's not what we understand. Jesus has an interaction with some children. And look with me at the next story in verse 18. There's a rich young ruler. And we get that from looking in Matthew 19, Mark 10, and Luke 18. This rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he says, Good master, what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life? The first thing that Jesus says, look at verse 19. Why do you call me good? I want you to look at your outline there. The personal encounter with the rich young ruler. God is the absolute standard of righteousness. Jesus says, why do you call me good? Who are you comparing me to? God is the standard. We should not compare ourselves and say, well, I'm better than most. That makes me good. That makes me good enough. No, no, God. When I look at God, I realize how not good. I realize what a sinner I am. A few years ago, I heard about a preacher who was taking his family up into the mountains to, for a ski trip. As they were driving along, they saw a flock of sheep over in a pasture. The grass was green, there was some mud there, the black dirt. Against the grass and the black dirt, the sheep looked white. They, they looked pure. They went on their snow trip, their ski trip. As they were coming back down out of the mountains, there was a fresh snow that had fallen. And the ground was blanketed with that white snow. Now, as they drove by and saw that same flock of sheep, you know what the sheep looked like? Against the white snow, they looked dirty and dingy and yellow. It wasn't the same. It was the same sheep, but the backdrop had changed. You and I must avoid comparing ourselves to the backdrop of the world. What we must see is the holiness, the perfection, the righteousness of God. If we see God for who He is, then we will see ourselves for who we are how desperately we need God's help to be saved. Jesus has this conversation with the man. He talks about the commandments. The man says he's kept those from his youth. You know, he's starting to feel pretty good. He says, but what do I still lack? And Jesus says, go and sell all that you have and give to the poor, and then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. The man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. He wasn't willing to let go of those. Now, Jesus, as he talks with the disciples in verse 24, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, who then can be saved? But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. This prosperity theology, the health and wealth, the social gospel, this isn't something that we hear just because we live in the, the 21st century. This has been around forever. The Jews thought whoever was rich, it could only be because they must be good. God was blessing them. And what Jesus points out is that the two do not equate. They're, they're not directly related. People can be rich for good reasons or bad reasons. That's not a measurement of righteousness. That's not a measurement of blessing or salvation. What we see is that that idea of trying to think, well, if people are blessed here, then they must be good in the spiritual realm. They must be set, ready to go, is not what Jesus describes. In fact, what Jesus says is that salvation, from a human standpoint with men, this is impossible. Cannot be achieved. I want you to understand what the Bible says. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through, uh, through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace through faith. Paul would say in Titus 2, 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. There is something powerful you see, what Isaiah had spoken about is our filthy rags in Isaiah 64, 6. Our righteousness is unrighteousness. We don't measure. But God, by His grace, has provided something, has made something available in Christ that can accomplish what you and I need most. 
a Savior. The forgiveness of sins. The salvation of our soul. The hope of eternal life. Look with me in 1 Timothy chapter 2. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is talking about this very thing. And he says, beginning in verse 3, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. If you understand that, we understand what God meant. As John wrote in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. You see, if God had not gone first, if God had not initiated a plan, salvation would be impossible. But God did act. God did plan. God did send Jesus. And so therefore the desire that God would provide salvation has been accomplished in Jesus Christ. It has been made available to the whole world. It is offered through the good news, the gospel. That's what Jesus meant when he said, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Salvation can only be made available by grace. By grace. We need to recognize that. We need to understand what that means. There was a man who was fishing in his boat in a, a swift and deep river. The boat was overturned. The man was fighting desperately before he would drown. He was calling for help. There was a man standing on the side of the river with a rope. He threw the rope within the man's reach. He said, grab the rope and I will pull you to safety. The man grabbed the rope. The man pulled him out of the river. There he was on the side, saved. Now I want to ask you, how was that man saved? How was he saved? He was saved by grace through faith. He had an offer of something that he didn't earn. He didn't deserve, he didn't have something to be expected from that man standing on the side of the river. That man did that out of an unconditional concern for that man's life. That man grabbed the rope. He trusted that the offer would be fulfilled. God, in sending Jesus Christ to the cross, has given us his grace. He's made that gift available, and it's our responsibility to put our trust in Jesus and the words that God has said through the gospel. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. We recognize that that's a gospel message. When Jesus said, unless you, are, unless you repent, except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus said that whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father. Jesus said, except you are born again of the water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You see, those parts of the gospel, we respond by faith. We trust what God says, that God will fulfill his promises. And those instructions, those commands are not something by which we earn salvation, but we accept the grace that God makes available. There's not one of us who would have been worthy to go to the cross and be nailed to it and die for others. We wouldn't have been worthy even to die for ourselves. It would have been merely what we deserve for our sins. But Christ, but Christ, God who is rich in mercy, let His Son take our place. See, being good is not good enough. And there are too many people that misunderstand. If you look at the bottom of your outline, some people hear this and they say, this sounds too good to be true. I read in a book, Amazing Grace by Charles Hodge, over 30 years ago, he said, no, it is too good not to be true. We go around all the time and we talk to people and there are people who say, well, I'm too good to be lost. Wrong. There are people who are lost today because they have an inadequate sense of sin. They're confused because of something that they've heard, because they think something's in the Bible when it's not. 
They've trusted in something that isn't true. And it's not like we need to go around beating people over the head, but we need to let them know what the Bible says. There is none righteous. All have sinned. Come short of the glory of God. There are some people who think, well, I'm too bad to be saved. No, you're just in the same boat as the rest of us. You're in the same condition of all sinners. We're lost. And it's only by the grace of God that salvation can be available. And it's only through faith that you can receive what that grace offers to you. Do not look at yourself and somehow feel like you're too good to be lost or you're too bad to be saved. The gospel is for everyone. The gospel is so that everyone can have the opportunity to know the Savior. Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. What Jesus meant was everything that was necessary to open the door, to let salvation be made known, proclaimed to all the world, to every person, it was finished. The gospel was ready to tell. The good news was ready to be made known. There is no substitute for Christ. There is no goodness. There is no good deed. There is no heroic act that someone can do that will all of a sudden God will say, now that person no longer needs my son. No, we all need the son. We all need that. There is another reason that sometimes people give for why they have not yet obeyed the gospel. And I want to be able to answer this this morning for you too because I think too many people have said or concluded in their mind, there's time. There's time. I, I can put this off. I can wait. I don't need to do this today. I'll just wait next week, next month, next year. I'll just do it before I die. Understand that not one of us has a guarantee of another hour or another day. You may live many more years, but you don't know it. You can't know it. You can't be assured of it. There are things that happen all the time. Just this week, there was a plane flying from Paris to Egypt that disappeared. 66 souls on that plane no doubt thought that they were going to arrive at their destination and continue about their lives. But what happened? And you may say, well, that was a terrorist act. I just won't go anywhere where terrorists are. Good luck with that. That's going to be impossible too. And I don't say that for doom and gloom. What I'm saying is you just don't know. There are so many different ways in which people's lives come to a sudden end. And I'm not trying to be a downer. What I'm trying to say to you is don't put off the greatest decision of your life. When God makes such an offer, don't say, well, maybe tomorrow. Say, that's too good to pass today. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that right now because that's the right thing to do. Because being good is not good enough. There was a king whose nation was becoming known for its thieves. So the king said, the only way I'm going to stop this and, and, and stop the reputation of what's happening in our country is to come out with a very severe penalty for stealing. So he made the penalty 100 lashes with a whip on a bare back for anyone who was caught stealing. The law went into effect. And the very first person who was caught stealing was the king's mother. You see, habits don't stop easy. The mother stole and the king was faced with this utter dilemma. What do I do? This is my mother. He retreated into seclusion for several days to consider how do I give her mercy and not make a mockery of the law that I instituted? And so he finally determined painstakingly that his, his mother would have to suffer the penalty. So everyone gathered to watch the public spectacle of his mother to be whipped 100 times. As everything was put in place and as the person there to execute the punishment raised the whip. The king raised his hand and said, stop. He said, I will take her place. And he pulled off his robe 
and he stepped down. His mother stepped aside, and the king took all 100 stripes for his mother. His mother went free. He had taken her place. You say, well, that's love. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ has done for you. He took your place. Today, will you accept the grace that is provided? Will you trust in Him by obeying His gospel? By becoming a child of God, being washed of your sins, and putting on Christ in the waters of baptism. The angels in heaven will rejoice at your decision. Won't you come right now? Make that decision. Don't say there's tomorrow. Right now, make that decision and give your life to the Lord who has that which is possible to save you. And if you are a child of God today and you realize in your life that somehow you've fallen back into that being good is good enough thought process, then repent of that today. If we can help you or encourage you, pray with you today. Just step down to the front right now while we stand and while we sing.